Just so you know, this show is about scary stuff. So don't say I didn't warn you guys. And remember, don't be scared. Episode 44 Nehemiah Griego War Baby here with another episode of Murderous Miners. The United States has been fighting against rising juvenile crime rates for decades, to no avail. It seems that no matter what punishments we invent, privileges we withhold, or legislation we enact, kids still break laws. And to be honest, so do adults. As juvenile crime soared, states began to introduce alternative sentencing structures. Violent offenses were becoming more prevalent, and the juvenile justice system found it impossible to adequately sentence those kids. Then came blended sentencing legislation enacted in multiple states, which generally works in one of three ways. One is that the judge can determine at the time of sentencing whether to impose a juvenile or adult sentence. Or the judge can impose both a juvenile and adult sentence. In this instance, the adult sentence is suspended until they reoffend. The judge may also sentence a minor to both juvenile and adult prison. A juvenile offender's detention record is an integral component in the formula that determines whether they are sentenced to adult prison after they've done their juvie time. One would assume that fact would be encouragement enough. And it certainly is for some, but of course not for everyone. On this episode of Murderous Miners, we visit a case out of Albuquerque, New Mexico, that I've been following since it took place in January of 2013. It has taken almost seven years to play out legally, but we'll start the story of the Griego family much further back than that. Greg Griego grew up in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and graduated Albuquerque High School, where he wrestled. He went on to college for a bit before joining the Army, eventually ending his military service in the National Guard. He married and had five children, however that relationship dissolved, and Greg found himself in the gang life, then in trouble with the law. Resigning in California, he was incarcerated for a few years where he turned to Christianity. In 1990, he met Sarah. He was 11 years older than her, but he didn't let on at first. They were married in 1994, and Greg returned to the Albuquerque area with his family. Greg Griego had five more children with Sarah, and the family lived on a compound off the 2800 block of Long Lane Southwest in the South Valley area. By January of 2013, Greg had been volunteering for 12-hour shifts at the Albuquerque Rescue Mission for the past three months. It was a homeless shelter that offered emergency overnight services to families with children aged 10 and younger, and his duties included assigning beds and blankets. The hulking figure monitored the sleeping individuals until his shift was done at 6 a.m. The Griegos still had four children living in the home, including 2-year-old Angelina, 5-year-old Gael, 9-year-old Zephaniah, and 15-year-old Nehemiah. Sarah homeschooled all of their children, but they spent the majority of their free time at Calvary Chapel, Albuquerque. Once out of prison, Greg had become a minister there for a while, but was focusing most of his time at that point on community outreach, such as co-founding a prison ministry. He was a volunteer chaplain with the Albuquerque Fire Department and regularly ministered in Mexico, sometimes with Nehemiah in tow. Even though the kids didn't attend school, they were heavily involved in church activities with kids their own ages. They also spent time with other homeschooled children. Nehemiah especially was busy there, playing basketball and other sports, while also playing the guitar, bass guitar, and drums. He played drums in one of Cavalry's bands called Velocity. He loved wearing camo in his dad's old fatigues and aspired to follow in his dad's footsteps and join the military. 
Cavalry Chapel Albuquerque is a so-called megachurch, one of thousands of network cavalry chapels around the country and abroad. Sprawling grounds and campuses with amenities like a bookstore, basketball courts, and skate park to keep the kids occupied. Sarah Griego was a devoted mother of five who was known for being very shy, but at the same time loved ministering to female and Spanish-speaking inmates and providing other outreach to women and families in Albuquerque. She loved the Bible, oldies music, and animals, keeping many chihuahuas as pets through the years. Even after Greg no longer worked at Cavalry, the Griegos remained devoted members of the congregation. He continued ministering and volunteering around Albuquerque, and on Friday, January 19, 2013, he was working one of those 12-hour volunteer shifts at the emergency center, beginning at 6 p.m. Sarah and the four youngest kids at home, Greg settled in and looked after families in need. At the house, 15-year-old Nehemiah and his mother Sarah had a disagreement around 9 p.m., Unbeknownst to his family, Nehemiah had been having homicidal and suicidal thoughts. He later reported hearing voices urging him toward violence since age eight. Conflicting reports about the Griego's home life fill the internet. While some of Greg's siblings and older kids admit he was stern, they also say that he was a good husband and loving father. Greg's co-workers and friends, including his church family, recalled seeing nothing out of the ordinary with the Griegos. But a neighbor did have this startling observation. I think he was a tyrant. And the, the kids under that type pressure, I didn't see any sign of love among those people. And one of Nehemiah's older sisters, who helped raise him, said when interviewed that he was a difficult child to rear. He completely scoffed at authority and did not make schoolwork a priority. Basically, he did what he wanted. For me, I never really saw any signs because I thought he was just a rebellious teenager that wanted to do whatever he wanted to, just didn't, didn't care to listen to authority. You know, he just wanted to do his own thing. He was just always kind of a jerk, especially towards me and my mom. Um, he would just always call us names all the time, and he would curse at us. That was my brother, and you know, and then for me, I always kind of feel like, you know, why did I see that coming? Why didn't I know something was up with him? Why didn't I ever, you know, notice the signs, I guess? And like Borton says, Griego never liked being an older brother and would get annoyed when his younger siblings tried playing with him. Without his parents' knowledge, 15-year-old Nehemiah had a girlfriend a 12-year-old he knew from Cavalry Chapel. Not only that, but he loved playing violent video games, Grand Theft Auto and Call of Duty Modern Warfare specifically. Where exactly he played these games is unknown, as family members would later say that video games of any kind were off-limits inside the Griego home. In terms of the video games, there have been some reports from neighbors and, and other folks who looked around that this family didn't allow their kids to, to play these kinds of video games or watch these kinds of movies. Do you have some sense that he was doing this sort of underground, unbeknownst to his parents? Or what more can you tell us about this? Because it seems to kind of contradict some of the published reports so far. What I can tell you is he played those types of video games per his own admittance, uh, and that he enjoyed playing those types of video games. Whether he did it, did it without his parents' knowledge, um, I don't know. Uh, but I know that he play those games on a regular basis. Uh, I'm sorry if this has already been asked, but he, did he give you specific titles of the game? It has already been asked. Uh, one of the games that he talked about was Modern Warfare, and the other one was uh, Grand Theft Auto. Did you say he played, that he played them often? Are we talking an obsession where it was up all night, or are we just talking on a you know, regular basis like a normal team might play the games? Um, all I can answer is that he said he played them on a regular basis. I don't know. To what extent? About four hours after the disagreement with his mother, Nehemiah retrieved a 22 rifle with scope from the master bedroom closet. He approached Sarah, who was sleeping in bed with nine-year-old brother Zephaniah. She wouldn't fight back if she was asleep, he would later say. The shots that struck and killed 40-year-old Sarah Griego as she slept woke her youngest son at her side.
Nehemiah would later recall that his nine-year-old brother awoke, startled and alarmed, instantly distraught. Per his own admittance, he lifted his dead mother's bullet-riddled head and showed it to his little brother, because he couldn't convince him that what he was seeing was real. The nine-year-old attempted to wipe blood from their dead mother's face with tissues from the bedside table. And then, Nehemiah shot him in the head as well. Later, he would tell police that he chose to turn off his conscience and let the beast out as he headed to his younger sister's bedroom. Nehemiah then shot his two-year-old sister Angelina before killing five-year-old Gael. It was 1 a.m., and he took the opportunity to text his 12-year-old girlfriend a picture of his dead mother. Greg Griego was not due home from his volunteer shift until around 6 a.m. As he waited for his, as he awaited his father's return, Nehemiah shot the AR-15 outside for practice, had an energy drink, and played with one of the family dogs. For the next five hours, Nehemiah lay in wait, hiding silently in a darkened downstairs bathroom. When his father entered the home, he allowed him to walk past the darkened doorway several times before he attacked. This time, his weapon of choice was that AR-15, one of the many firearms legally purchased by Greg Griego. After a break-in attempt while Sarah and the kids were home, Greg had acquired a mini arsenal, teaching his wife and older kids how to protect themselves in his absence. Doubtful he ever dreamed his own son would turn the weapon against him, killing him before he got far enough into the house to know that his wife and three of his kids were dead. In his confession, Nehemiah explained that he next loaded up the back of the family minivan with the AR-15, two twenty-two rifles, and extra ammo. His plan was to carry out a mass shooting in a populated area of town, then die in a shootout with the cops. Nehemiah's first stop after leaving in the van was to head to the South Valley Walmart, where he stayed inside the vehicle for more than an hour. He had the AR-15 and one of the twenty-two rifles with a scope, which he aimed at clueless shoppers as they went about their Saturday mornings. Nothing happened there, and deviating from his original plan, Nehemiah picked up his girlfriend and took her to Cavalry Chapel, Albuquerque. She would hook up with her grandmother there, and she and Nehemiah would meet up occasionally throughout the rest of the day. As he encountered other members of their congregation, he began telling people that his family was dead. What he told them differed, but several churchgoers did report that he said they had died in a car accident. He told people his family's bodies were still in their home. His girlfriend's grandmother alerted the pastor. Following the Saturday evening service, the pastor called the head of security to report what he had been hearing. That morning, Vince, a former police officer, had been conducting active shooter training on campus, and he had seen Nehemiah. He wasn't aware until later that the Griego's family van was parked nearby, full of guns and ammo. Around 9.15 p.m., the pastor, the head of security, and Nehemiah began driving to the family's home. Vince would say in many interviews later that he had a bad feeling, so he pulled over and had sheriff's deputies meet him at their destination. They used Nehemiah's house key to enter the residence. We already know the horror of what they found on Long Lane Southwest. Nehemiah was taken into custody and waived his right to having an attorney or other adult present. His interview lasted an hour and a half. At first, he said that he had been at a friend's house since Thursday and that he had returned to his house around 5.30 a.m. on Saturday morning. He explained that the door was locked and that he entered and systematically found each of his family members dead. He told police that he didn't call for help because he panicked, instead driving to Cavalry Chapel. But Nehemiah doesn't hold up under intense questioning and eventually told the truth that he'd been thinking about homicide and suicide for the past week, and that he'd become frustrated with his mother just prior to the massacre. The probable cause statement reveals that Nehemiah lied to investigators several times about how the loaded rifles ended